Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Justin Briley and today on Unbelievable we're discussing the problem of evil and asking if there is a God, why does he allow suffering? Well joining me as usual are a Christian and atheist guest. Vince Vitali is senior tutor at the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics. His latest book, co-authored with Ravi Zacharias, is called Why Suffering and aims to give a range of helpful responses to a question that simply never goes away. Here to dialogue with Vince is Julian Bagini. He's a philosopher and author who writes on a variety of subjects, including religious belief. As an atheist, he'll be explaining why the problem of suffering presents challenges for belief in God. So Vince and Julian, thank you for joining me on the program today. Thank you Thanks for having us. Uh, we'll make sure to give links to your websites and that kind of thing later on in the program. Um, but just for the moment, um, we're tackling such a big issue today, and even in the time we've got, I'm sure we'll barely be able to do it justice. One that many people have debated down the years, down the centuries. But of course, um, in a sense, tragic stories never go away. They're always in our headlines, and it might be good to start by looking at one or two. Before we do that, let's have a quick introduction to you both. Um, Vince, you're a philosopher, a Christian one. Uh, you work out in Oxford. How did you get into all that? Uh, I didn't grow up in a Christian home uh, myself. Uh, I grew up in uh, sort of a culturally Catholic home. I guess if you had asked me if I was a Christian, I, I probably would have said yes, but it meant that that was something I was born mm. into as an Italian-American from New Jersey. Uh, I went to university and I, I met some people who when they said they were Christian it seemed to mean something different. It seemed mm. to have a, a practical concrete relevance in their day-to-day -day life. That gave me pause uh, and I began a sort of search about what it was that these people believed. My assumption at the time was that in order to have faith it had to be blind. You had to sort of park your mm. brain mm. on the side. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised to find people who didn't think that, didn't think that faith and reason had to be um, intention, and it was partly through my interest in philosophy, which was already there, and digging deeper into some Christian philosophy that I would say Christianity became a live option for me. Sure. It became something that I, I could see as plausible, uh, and that opened the door to me um, taking Jesus seriously, taking his life seriously, starting to ask questions about whether or not that is someone who uh, I wanted to follow. And then mm -hmm. the, the philosophy just continued from there, um, through graduate studies, uh, and I teach that now, and I particularly enjoy interacting with the sorts of questions mm. that I was interacting with when I was seeking faith for the first time, and, and the questions that I continue to wrestle with. You're not the first person to produce a book on suffering. <laughs> um, it is a massive issue, as I said. Um, what, what inspired you at this point to, to take that one on? Yeah, fair point. Why, why another book on suffering when there are so many? I guess part of my response is, uh, Christian, atheist, everyone in between, I think it's something that we're all called to. We all need to take suffering seriously. We all need to take those who suffer seriously. So when I was deciding what to do in my uh, graduate studies, both because of just that, that personal calling that um, dealing with suffering had to be a significant component of my life, and also knowing that this was a, one of the big hurdles for me to get over, in order to take faith seriously, and for many who I've spoken with in mm. order to take faith seriously. Mm. I wanted to do my uh, PhD studies on a topic that I, I thought was relevant and was a question that actually a lot of people um, ask. Through that, I've, I've come to think that there are a variety uh, of helpful responses to the question, not a, not a one-size-fits-all answer, but uh, a number of helpful uh, responses. And my co-author and I hoped that by putting a variety of the responses together in one book, having mm. one chapter on each of a variety of responses, um, it could be a resource that would be helpful. I mean, one of the chapters is based primarily on the work you did in your PhD. Now, <clears throat> I guess you have to boil it down a lot, if you like, to make it accessible for the average person. Sure, that's true, but it's a great exercise. Uh, I think it was C.S. Lewis who said, and probably lots of other people as well, that if you can't distill your ideas to explain them in an accessible way to someone without expertise, then you haven't properly understood, understood them. Yourself. Exactly yeah, right. Yeah. So, so that was a, that was a really good um, exercise um, to do that. And this is an approach um, which is is on the newer side. There are um, hints of it in uh, philosopher Leibniz. Um, Robert Adams, who was one of my PhD supervisors, wrote about it uh, to some extent in the 70s. Uh, and then 1970s, and then left some of the ideas. And basically in my PhD, I picked up some of his ideas and, and took them further. 
Well, it would be good to explore that in some depth in the course of the programme today as, as we get to talk about that in particular. But uh, let's turn to our other guest today as well. Julian, thanks for joining me on the programme today. Thank you, Justin. Um, you, uh, you, you have a website, microphilosophy.net, and when I visited it, there was just such a, a wide range of things you seem to talk about. Um, uh, would you describe yourself as having any particular kind of focus in terms of your philosophical interests and that sort of thing? <laughs> Probably, some people would say not enough of a focus. <laughs> I think there are unifying themes for me. I think that uh, you know, ah, what it means to think clearly is something which is obviously kind of almost a meta-philosophical question. Is interesting in how to live well, I think. Those two things, and the, but they, they overspill, they cover mm. so much. And um, I'm not an academic, and I think one reason for that is that uh, to be an academic, you really do have to focus in, whereas my interest is in more of the connections between mm. the things, the bigger picture. So, you know, maybe I have to sacrifice some depth for breadth. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. true or not. Um, if I do, I think some people have got to do that. There's a division of labour mm. in philosophy, and um, I'm, I'm not one made for the deep, deepest minds, perhaps. <laughs> you probably wouldn't, though, describe yourself to, to most people as an atheist philosopher. Presumably, your philosophy doesn't, isn't particularly linked to you being an atheist, but I guess it has some implications. Yeah, it, it informs it, absolutely it informs it. But um, you know, to say I'm an atheist philosopher would make it sound as though everything I'm arguing for philosophically comes from an atheist basis, and, and it, it doesn't. You know, I mean, uh, I think I would imagine that a lot of the arguments I make, except really when they involve religion directly, are arguments that I would hope people could agree with or disagree with, and independently of their mm religious convictions. And also, you know, on the, this is an issue where I find myself very much kind of in, in opposition to the Christian mainstream, but I'm also very willing to acknowledge what contributions can be made, to, particularly to how we ought to live mm. um, in religious traditions. I mm. think that it's daft to, to dis dispense with them. So, you know, yeah, I'm an atheist and I'm, I'm not afraid to say that I'm, I'm <laughs> I'm not proud to say, it's just what I am. <laughs> but I wouldn't want everything that I, I wouldn't have to define everything about sure, me, you know? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Well, that, that's great. That, we're we're going to be talking about an issue that in many ways is a particular problem, you mm. could say, for Christians and theists. But at the same time is something that anybody, whatever their beliefs, has to deal with, suffering. Mm. Um, and obviously, our headlines are filled all the time with stories of one kind or another. <clears throat> and probably most recently, uh, there's been obviously the tragic event in Paris, which saw the murder of several journalists of Charlie Hebdo and police officers and so on. In a sense, that was an event that was perpetrated by people. Uh, it was a form of evil that you could say there was an intention behind. <clears throat> but then you do get other stories, and again, another similarly um, tragic case at the end of last year when in Glasgow, a dustbin lorry mounted a curb, killing six people three of whom were from the same family. And, and, and that, when I read that, made me think, gosh, it just seems so random. It seems so mm. wasteful. Mm -hmm. um, why? <laughs> you know, and that is always the question you come back to, don't you? Um, where do you begin with that kind of thing, Vince, when someone is struggling, probably on a personal level most of the yeah. time, with a, with a situation, a circumstance that's painful? Um, I'm guessing you don't roll in straight away with your PhD thesis at that point. <laughs> Certainly not. Um, yeah, I think that's the first thing I'd want to say. Uh, it's not always the time to address or to try to respond to the question, why? Why, uh, why suffering? Uh, I have a, a very uh, poignant example in my own life where uh, my aunt was conveying to me some terrible suffering that she had been through, and I did jump in with some of my more abstract philosophical ideas, this was many years ago, uh, and she listened to me uh, patiently and then she said, Vince, that doesn't speak to me as, as a mother, mm. uh, which I have come to think was a very fair um, response and I hope has helped me to listen a lot longer and to ask a lot more questions before I would think it would be uh, even time to have a conversation mm. about, mm. about the question of why. And when I uh, listen to s events like this, I mean, one thing that's important to me um, is I think we need to say things like that are evil, mm -hmm. uh, that they're objectively evil, that they really are evil. Um, and I hope that my Christian worldview um, and my understanding of God 
allows me um, mm. to do that. Uh, I mean, you, I see how that could easily be said of mm. the Charlie Hebdo um, tragedy. In a sense, though, in what sense is a, a, a bin lorry crashing into people on the street at Christmas time evil? Is it simply just a tragic accident? I mean, do, do we ascribe evil in that case? Sure. I think I would want to. I would want to use strong language there. Um, I'd want to use strong language, and I think, you know, from my Christian point of view, not to say that um, there aren't other ways uh, of talking about this, but from my Christian point of view, you know, each life is sacred. Mm. Um, each person is created in the image of God. Each person is loved by God. And so whatever explanation we give to the question of why, the fact that something sacred, a human mm. person, um, has suffered or has been uh, affected in that sort of way, I think we should say that that's evil. We should say that our starting point has to be that uh, something is bad about mm. that uh, and that's not ultimately what we should desire and not ultimately what um, uh, what a God would want in the end. Same question to, to you, Julian. When, when you are confronted mm. with <clears throat> tragedies or people who are going through something, what's your response to them on a practical level? Well, I mean, it's, it's very difficult. I, I think it's very hard to say anything that could be of help to people. Um, you know, if you say to people, it's going to be all right, for example, that can mm. be so trite. I mean, mm. you know, mm. often even, for a start, that's not really ever really true, actually. Things are never all right again for people when they've been through these things. Things can get okay again, but things are never the same. But also, you seem not credible at the time. And, you know, I think that the most difficult thing, well, you know, there's a kind of suffering of having to be around with someone who you love, who is suffering, mm. and being unable to help mm. them. Mm. Ultimately, I think all you can do is, you know, be there for them. And it sounds so thin, but ultimately, that's the only thing you can do. They, they know that they're loved, that they have support, that you have the, their sympathy is with them, but you can't pretend you can take that pain away and you can't pretend to mm. explain it or, or justify it. And then people need in their own time to work through it in whatever way they do. Do, do you ever go down the route as an atheist of trying to say that there, there's gonna, you're gonna see why this, you know, there's a reason behind this. No, I no, mean, I, you just can't go down that. No, way, I know you, you. No, I don't think you can. And I think that's, uh, it's, it's interesting how difficult it is. Pe you, you say that people naturally ask why, and mm. they do actually a lot of the time. And mm. I'm always a bit baffled because I, I know it's possible to break that habit because I think that if you get accustomed to a worldview in which you accept that you know things don't happen with an ultimate purpose, things just happen. You do stop asking why after a while, genuinely. Mm. Um, so, you know, if, if I, you know, I haven't, I've been lucky so far, I haven't had a major disease, but I had a, a worrying um, diagnosis, well, worrying symptoms which weren't yet diagnosed. Mm. There's a potential of being something serious mm. and life threatening. Mm. And I didn't ask myself, why me? Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I thought it happened to other people. You know, of course it could happen. I kind of expect mm. at some stage something really nasty to happen. Mm. So, you can get out of that way of thinking, but it, it, the default for people is to want to know why and to think there must be a reason. And if that's what people are thinking, it can be very hard to say there's no why, it just happens. Sure. Yeah. I just wanted to pick up on the, the importance of, of just being there um, with someone uh, and affirm that. I think that's one of the things, you know, from my Christian perspective, that's one of the things, and this is not a statement of its truth or its falsity, mm -hmm but it's one of the things I value about the Christian tradition in particular, uh, is that if there is a God who actually has lived a human life and actually suffered and knows what um, suffering is, then for anyone who's, who's suffering, I can say to them that they don't need to wonder whether there's someone who exists who understands what they're going through or if there's someone um, who cares. And that, that's, that's something that's attractive to me about my faith that I don't think anyone ever has to go through suffering in isolation and I can offer my faith and, and my God as someone who understands and who can be there uh, amidst that. And, I, and I, agree, I agree in a sense with what you said about it will never be all right. I, I want to be really careful, and I think you do too, to not 
say, uh, well, it's not a big deal that you've gone yeah. through this terrible piece of suffering, or that's fine, but don't worry, you'll see eventually mm -hmm. that, um, that, that that wasn't really evil, or, or anything along those lines. And yet at the same time, I hope that, because I do believe that there can be an afterlife which can be And you believe in that sense, the why question is one that everyone should and can ask. That it is one that we do naturally ask, which is not to say that we can't get to a point where we stop asking that in the same sort of regular way. Um, but I had friends recently who uh, went through a miscarriage and for them that was quite devastating. Um, the woman had to have surgery, um, lost uh, a lot more blood than she should have. It was very, it was traumatic for them uh, and they are Christians and they decided to name the uh, baby Hope because um, from their perspective they really do believe that there's the possibility of being a family together um, with that child in heaven which again is not an argument for the truth or the falsity of the Christian faith but when we're talking about res how do we respond mm. to real life suffering it's something I really value about my tradition that I can call it evil but I can also say that there is real hope and at the same time, I can say there is always someone who knows what you've been through. I'm going to pick up on something you said there, because I, what's quite interesting is that I can see how what you're saying about if you believe that God is always there for you, that can be a kind of a comfort. But on the other hand, I'm, I think you'll agree with me on this, that there is a tendency for a lot of people to actually dismiss Christianity on that basis that, oh, you know, you just got this comfort. Mm. And actually, it's a lot more complicated than that, isn't it? So first yeah. of all, it's at times like these that people go in different ways. And for some people, it's a crisis of faith. They, they lose someone. There seems to be no reason for it. They can't understand why their loving God would want it for them. And they really struggle with that. And that's one thing. And another thing is that no matter how profound people's faith are, you know, it, it doesn't stop it being really, really hard. And I think this is a very interesting point about this because, you know, people often say there are no... You know, atheists in foxholes is the old <laughs> phrase. But, you know, at the graveside, you know, there are very few people who act, as it were, as if they're 100% convinced that this is just a temporary separation and they're going to be together. You know, the, the separation feels very, very real. And there's not, you know, if you ever see someone with the blithe confidence, like smiling, oh, it's all right, we're going to see them soon. That's really weird no. and isn't uh, actually and, and isn't typical. What happens. It isn't what no, happens. No, absolutely. Though. But... Uh, I mean, there's a there's a real struggle there. Absolutely, you know, you've, I've lost people I love. You've lost people you love, and and I miss them. Um, and yet, uh, uh, I have been at memorial services, uh, funerals um, of Christian friends who believe with strong conviction that they're going to see this person again, mm -hmm. and they're going to be in great friendship again. And it does look different. And you really you find both in full measure. You find the grief, but you also find I mean, a celebration. You sort of write about this interestingly in terms of Jesus. There's the story of him raising Lazarus from the dead. And yet, the most, one of the most famous verses in Scripture, Jesus wept. And, and you, you sort of say, well, why did Jesus weep if he knew he was about to raise his friend Lazarus? Yep. So, and, and draw out this point about that, that Jesus kind of understood the nature of the suffering we go through. I that, think that's that right. Moment. I think I think both can be there in full measure. That that real weeping and note there that Jesus, Lazarus's sisters Mary and Martha are not very impressed that Jesus has come late and their brother has died before he gets there. And it, it could have been the time where Jesus mm -hmm. says, "Well, here's why I had to wait. Here's my reasoning. Here's why. Here's why suffering." He doesn't do that, which I think is a good model. He just weeps with them. Um, but then also, there is the celebration at the rising of Lazarus and that pointing to the fact that there can be an afterlife and we can mm -hmm. live together um, with, the, the, with people. There is a flip side of this though which I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on which is that for a lot of Christians believe that as well as eternal salvation there's eternal damnation. Now and whenever I talk about this with Christians they're obviously very careful to say that it's not for them to judge sure. so they will not have an opinion about that it's not for them to say whether someone is going to go to hell, even though intellectually they, they believe that without having accept Christ into your life, you won't go to heaven. But that means that there must be situations where you lose someone, where someone dies, and at the very least you have grave cause for concern. That person, you may not meet them again. It might be your mother, your brother, your father, your daughter, your son. And it's, it's not just, it seems to magnify it. 
they haven't just suffered and died, they might be facing eternal torment. Isn't that, isn't that far more discomforting than any comfort you could get that you're going to be reconciled with some people in yep. the afterlife? Fair challenge, very fair challenge. Um, I think that I can always hold out hope for anyone who, um, who has died. Uh, I, uh, I think that partly because I've seen in my own life, it's often been when people who uh, I love have been closest to death. My dad has um, been close to death at times and hasn't, um, hasn't passed on, but it's in those times that uh, my assessment of the situation is that actually his kind of spiritual sensitivity is heightened in those times. We can give different explanations for that, but mm-hmm. um, uh, God is reaching out to him in an even stronger way uh, in even those moments before he might die. So I never want to say that I can't have hope for someone that they could wind up uh, in heaven. And in that sense, I think I can always kind of retain that hope. Um, but there is that reality in the Christian faith and different Christians think of this differently. Um, some think of this as an eternal conscious state. John Stott thought of it as uh, an annihilationist view, which would be more perhaps like an atheist view where mm-hmm. um, we cease to exist. Um, but from my perspective, I think it, it is uh, important that we don't take um, medieval paintings of fire and torture uh, and just kind of put that uh, on uh, onto Christianity as the assumed understanding of what hell would be like. My understanding uh, of hell is that if a person in their heart doesn't want to be um, with God, um, God's not going to force someone to be um, with them. I think that would be a terrible state to be in because I think we were made to be in strongest relationship with that person. Um, God. Um, But what exactly that state uh, looks like, uh, I don't presume to have um, a lot of of knowledge of knowledge about, but I see it as um, a a place of choosing not to be, not to live in relationship with God, not as a, uh, not as a place that God sort of sends you so that um, he can find the worst ways to torture you, but actually him allowing you to live with that choice. I mean, does that help or or not? So much, I don't know whether that kind of well, it, <laughs> if softens the blow. It, it, it softens the blow if you don't believe that whatever hell is, it's a place where people are going to suffer in perpetuity. If it's some kind of annihilation, then it, that helps to a certain extent. But I still think it sort of it, le- it leaves a, 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 a kind of a, a bitterness there because, you know, even if it's just an absence of an eternal life, you know, in that mm. eternity, you're going to have this awareness of this lost opportunity. And I guess, and, and the other thing that I have to say, though, that I, I find difficult listening to that is, you know, you say about it, it's choosing not to live with God. I mean, that really isn't how it feels. I mean, I, I, I actually get quite agitated when mm-hmm. um, Christians describe atheists like myself as people who have, are choosing to reject God or choosing to reject Christ. Because that's not how it seems. What it seems to us is we simply, we can't believe in God because it doesn't add up to us for one reason or another. Now, if that's because we're too stupid or, or blinded or whatever it mm. might be to see it, that's one thing, but it's certainly not a choice. It's not a rejection of God. And so I do find it hard to see. I mean, sure. we don't drift too much. Well, no, I, find it, yeah, I find I, it hard I, to see how well, God would, you know. I think that's fair. And I, and I would just want to say that because of the way I understand God's character and his love for each person, um, that he would ensure that at some point, even if it is in those dying moments, he would ensure that each person does have an opportunity to choose him if that's what they would desire. What I wouldn't want to say is, Julian, you, you have had um, the choice and it's, it's your fault for not making that decision mm. at this point. Only God knows our stories and how he's reaching out to us and when that time is. Perhaps, uh, Vince, it would be good, uh, we don't have time to cover all of the ways in which you approach the issue of, of suffering in the book. But in particular, I wanted to at least talk about the, the work you've put into this at an academic level and now, as it were, presented in a way that's accessible in the book. Um, you've called the chapter The Response of Grace. Do you want to just briefly walk us through what this particular response to why God might allow suffering is? Sure. Uh, here's the uh, general idea, and I, I take this not to be a, a sufficient response in and of itself, but a, a component uh, of, a, of a helpful response. I think oftentimes when we um, think about this challenge of suffering, we can tend to picture ourselves um, or those we love in this world with all of its suffering. 
then we can uh, picture ourselves in a very different world with far less suffering or with no suffering. Uh, and then we might think to ourselves, we might wonder, if there is a God, why wouldn't he have created me in this world with far less suffering rather than in our current world mm. and all of its suffering? Uh, I think that's a reasonable um, thought, but I think it's a thought that relies on a philosophical mistake because it relies on the assumption that it would still be us, it would still be you and me as the individuals that we are in that very different world. And I don't think that's the case. I tell a story in the book of my parents on their second date and they're standing on the Brooklyn Bridge. My dad notices uh, a ring on my mom's finger and he asks about it. And she says, oh, that's just some ring one of my old boyfriends gave to me. I just wear it because I think it looks nice. He says, oh, it is nice. Let me see it. She takes it off and hands it to him. And my dad throws it off the bridge um, and watches it sink to the bottom of the East River. Um, the question I draw out of that is, my mom happened to love that. Okay, I think that was the clinching moment for her. <laughs> but if she hadn't, if she had decided, what a jerk, what a man. jerk, I better run back with the old boyfriend instead. What would that have meant for me? And I might be tempted to think, oh, that might have been better for me. The other guy might have been taller. He might have been more athletic. He might have been better looking. He might have had more money. But if I start to think down those lines, I think I'm thinking in the wrong way. If my mom had wound up with the other guy rather than my dad, it's not me who would have come to exist. Maybe some other child would have come to exist. Maybe he would have been taller and had more money. But it wouldn't have been me mm. because part, at least, of what makes me who I am is my origin. The parents that I have, the sperm and egg that I came from, the combination of genes that's true of me. And I think sometimes when we think about the problem of suffering, something similar can be going on. We picture one world with us in it. We picture a very different world that we would have liked to have come to exist in. And we don't think about the assumption there that it would still be me mm. in that world. Uh, I then couple that idea with the question, what if it's the case that uh, God really likes the idea of each of us existing? What if it's the case that God actually loves each individual person? Um, what if he created the sort of world that would allow us to come to exist because mm -hmm. he wanted us to exist, because he desired to um, invite us into relationship But for uh, you to himself. exist as Vince Vitale required, probably, in your parents' lives and their grandparents' lives and great-grandparents' lives, a fair bit of suffering that kind of created the kinds of events that led to your parents meeting and, and you sitting here. That's right. And certainly if, if whether or not my dad throws a ring off of a bridge can affect who comes to exist, then changing uh, big things about the universe such that it would be one that wouldn't have the um, threats to natural uh, disaster mm. or the possibilities of evil um, uh, as a product of free will would certainly be enough to, to say that we wouldn't come to exist mm. or perhaps even beings of our type. And in a sense, the, if you like, God is willing to allow that, the level of suffering that we do therefore experience and see and, and evil and so on in the universe because he thinks the end product I, you and me and Julian is worth it in the end. Yeah, not because he desires the evil and the suffering. And I want to be careful here not to um, uh, portray this approach as uh, an overly instrumentalist one, where it's kind of, is this suffering um, uh, allowable for mm. that end? Yeah. Um, I don't think of this so much as a greater goods approach where we say, here's the evil and suffering does the good outweigh the evil mm, and suffering? Mm. I think of it more of a love for individual persons approach. I don't think the primary question in God's mind is one of a calculation of whether or not we get overall maximal value or mm. greater mm. world value on this approach than on that approach. I, I see God as aimed for um, beings like us and perhaps also the individuals that come to exist and creating out of love for those. That doesn't mean that it's an easy choice just like I don't think it's an easy choice for human parents to decide to have a child. Um, you're doing something that you know full well, if you do that willfully, is, is going to result in serious suffering because any child, even with the most favorable life, will undergo serious suffering and ultimately one day death. Mm. So you're doing something, even as a human parent, that you know is going to result in serious suffering and in death. But we think that it could be uh, 
still an act of love or even an act of courage if it's done out of love for that child with a commitment mm, to do everything yes. you can for that child with a commitment um, to make sacrifices for that child. And so I want to think about God in a way that's that sort way. of analogous yeah. there. That's between... a really interesting way of putting it. Okay, well, well you've got here yeah. in a sense what sometimes is technically termed a theodicy, um, a, a way of explaining mm. why there might be suffering, why God might allow that um, because mm. of some, some other purpose, greater purpose, uh, mm. you know, what, what do you make of this particular well, one? Well, I think there are several uh, problems with it. I mean, one is, is, I think Vince is exactly right, that in a way to wish for a universe in which there was no suffering would be to wish yourself out of existence. Mm. But that doesn't solve the problem, actually. What it merely shows is that, you know, actually, if you ask the question, oh, why did God... It, it, you, could, you can think intellectually it, it would have been better for God to have created a world with no suffering or less suffering that would have been better. Now, I wouldn't wish that be <laughs> for myself because it meant I wouldn't exist, mm. but it would still be better. So, you know, one can judge that it would be better without mm. suffering while acknowledging that would mean not you, right? Mm. But the second thing is, is that the parental analogy is a, an interesting one, but I, I don't think it works for what you're saying because, okay, let's take your, your parents. You say a parent loves their child and that's why they, they bring them into the world. But until that particular child has come into the world, your mum did not love you yes. before you were born. If the night you were conceived, um, one of them had had a terrible headache and uh, a different child had been conceived the next day, they would have loved that other child equally as much. Now, similarly, from God's point of view, it seems if you believe that God loves each and every one of us and he loves us for who we are as individuals, not just because we're carriers, of that might all be true, but until anyone comes into existence, the range of possible people who could have come into the existence is infinite. And it would seem weird to me to think that, you know, God had to arrange things in this way because in his plan, he wanted Vince Julian <laughs> and Justin to come into the, into the world as opposed to any number of other possible people who would have come into the world and would have been just as lovable because that would be the point. Your idea of God and an idea of a parent is not that they create children or human beings and they only love the ones that fit their pre-existing <laughs> template of who they are. Yeah. They love them whoever they are. Mm. So I can't really see how this uh, explanation actually explains why, and, why and God did it. Yeah. No, yeah. no, okay. I, I think, yeah. Right. No, good, good okay. challenges, yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't want to commit myself to saying this is the only universe God has right. created. Um, so maybe it is the case that God has created those other universes um, that would have been better in some objective sense and would have included other people. All I want to say is that it's not clear to me that God has shown he's done something wrong if he also creates our universe and the individuals that are included in this universe. If we think to ourselves, God has wronged me by creating a universe like this, I think that's at least a more complicated question than it initially yeah. seems like. If I wouldn't have existed otherwise, and if I'm offered a life that mm. is good mm. on the whole. But uh, I agree uh, that there's no reason to think God wouldn't have loved other beings, other types mm. of beings, or even other beings like human persons who are different individuals. And I have no problem um, with, with speculating mm. that God could have created lots of universes with lots of um, different types of, uh, of individuals as well. Mm. Yeah. Does that help? Well, well, <laughs> it kind of helps, but I, I think I, I don't know. To me, it seems to have undercut the, the force of the of the of the theodicy because um, unless there's some, you know, the argument seems to rest on the thought that there's something important that we, the, the people who happen to have come into existence, came into existence, mm. and that that um, could only have happened if everything else had been true, including suffering. And I'm not sure what you said there really are, uh, deals with that problem. Um, yeah, so I'm, I mean, I'm happy to defend that a, a little bit as well. Uh, um, all, all I feel I, I want to say and need to say is that however many types of beings God has decided to create, and I don't think he would have an obligation to create mm. every single kind, yeah. but whichever ones he create, he created them out of love for the individuals um, who came into existence. I think that's all um, that, uh, that I need to say. Um, on that point, and, and as long as he does that, I think I think I'm okay. 
um, with, with the way I'm understanding it. Um, it's not the case that God would have wronged any of the beings who he didn't decide mm. to create. Right, because they never they never come to exist. So it's not like they've been harmed or wronged by God making a decision not to create them or not to create them at a certain time. But whether he's created just us and this universe or whether he's created many universes with lots of individuals, I want to say that he's he's done so because he desired that individual um, those individual persons. And right. Those specific well, people as opposed to it could have been well, any. Well, that, that's a that, strange thought, yeah. I think. Because and, that, and that's a good, yeah, that's a good, that's a good challenge. And I'm, um, I'm, I'm happy to think about the the approach on in two different ways. Um, it could be the case that God is aiming very specifically for individuals, um, but if you're someone who believes in free will, mm. and if you're someone who doesn't believe uh, in uh, Molinism, mm -hmm. uh, meaning if you're someone who doesn't believe that uh, before creation God would know how every free person would act in any situation he mm -hmm. could put them in, mm -hmm. then even if God could know everything from an outside-of-time perspective, uh, the way that he knows certain things in the future is because they actually happen. Mm -hmm. And it runs from the thing actually happening to God knowing it. If that's the case, then that knowledge of how we act freely in the future is not knowledge, even if God has it, that he would take into account when creating. Mm. On that version of this approach, what I'm wanting to say is that God could still aim for beings like us. Mm -hmm. Even if he's not aiming for the specific mm. individual, he's aiming for beings like us. And I think that goes back to Julian's point about human procreation, having a child. When you have a child, you don't know that you're going to get Julian mm. or Justin. You know that you're going to get your first child or your, your second child, and you have a commitment to love whoever it is that is specifically produced. Mm. You can think about this approach in that way, where God is creating an environment that allows certain types of beings to come into existence with a commitment mm. to love whichever individuals happen to come into yeah, existence. Yeah, but see, for me, that just leaves the basic puzzle intact, because it seems to me that I can imagine the, the puzzle then becomes Okay, God wants to create creatures something like us. Now, what do we mean by that? Creatures capable of loving him, sharing in eternity with him in some way, capable of learning, free will, et cetera, et cetera. So he wanted to create people like us. The puzzle seems to be that surely he could have created such people in, in such ways that didn't provide for as much sort of Almost, it seems like egregious suffering in the world. I mean, because these gratuitous things are gratuitous, suffering. almost, Maybe. yeah, gratuitous. Because, you know, it, it seems that you wouldn't have to go too far. I mean, so for example, um, strange with a slightly different justification. There's the idea that, you know, we have to learn, we have to suffer in order to learn, and so the forth. The sort but, of soul making theology. Yeah, but you know, the, the 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 obvious problem with that is, well, okay, true, but actually, what we have to learn, um, some things we don't have to learn, some things we learn easily. Sometimes, you know, um, you, you, you can learn by a very small experience. Why did God make us such bad learners, <laughs> you know, mm. that we really needed all this awful suffering in order to learn the important things about love? Yeah. Now, of course, you'll come back, you'll have answers to those kind of things. So what I'm saying is you're back to those, que <laughs> you're back to those questions. Yes. The basic problem still seems to be there, despite what you said about God's desire to create creatures like us and, yeah. and live with the consequences. And I think, I, I think um, that... God's love for us might be much more specific than just mm. beings that could relate to him, beings that are intelligent. Uh, God could create lots of other types of beings like that, beings that wouldn't necessitate some of the sorts mm. of sufferings that, uh, that exist in the world. And perhaps he has. Um, I just want to claim that he's also created us. And maybe, maybe what he uh, really loves about us is quite specific. Maybe it has specifics to do with our psychology and our biology and the, the narrative of the human race's um, history um, as well. It might be quite a specific love that he has. Uh, so the soul-making approach is an interesting one as well, this idea of... And this is covered to some extent in the book it's as covered well, to this some way extent. of thinking. Just, just kind of, uh, Julian sketched it out very mm. briefly, but, but yeah, just, just maybe elucidate it a bit as to what this particular approach to the yeah, issue it's, is. It's covered to some extent in, in the book, and again, I think it doesn't stand on its own, um, but I think it can be one of a number of approaches which um, is helpful. You can s see the environment um, as including different types of evil, but sometimes different types of evils that would be necessary in order for certain types of goods. 
especially the sorts of goods that form um, our character and can produce mm. meaning in our lives. Because it's hard to be compassionate if you don't have any cause if to, have, to be generous or to share nothing, something. Nothing to be compassionate about. Um, it's not clear you can display courage if there's never a, a genuinely dangerous situation in which you would um, display courage. Uh, one way that I sometimes like to think about this approach um, is to ask people to think of two or three of the greatest lives that they think have ever been lived mm. in, their, in their estimation and then to try to subtract from those lives all of the suffering or even a significant amount of the suffering, the suffering that they responded to, the injustice that they fought against, the suffering that formed their culture and their character. And what happens quite quickly is that all of a sudden those lives don't look anything like the lives that we were initially... That, that we're so inspired by. So inspired sure. by. So mm. that, that's, that's the, the sort of general approach there. And, and I, I, find, I find that um, compelling to an extent. Um, but I don't think that the bar can be that for any piece of suffering that we point to, I as a Christian should be able to say, and the soul-making value of that sure. is, or and the reason yeah, yeah. for that mm. is. Um, all the time, parents might have reasons for allowing a child to undergo something. A parent decides to move the family from one city to another. The child experiences that as genuinely horrible. It may genuinely be very difficult mm. for the child. It doesn't mean that the parents couldn't have had good reasons to do that or, um, or even be doing that for, for the child's sake. In my own life, what I find is that when I look back on suffering in my life, for some of it, I'm able to say, you know what, that made no sense at the time, um, yeah. but now I can understand and, in and, part and how that might an, be allowed. An atheist it could, could easily say the same. Of course, you, we can see the ways in which some hardships and suffering can develop our character in positive ways and looking back yeah, and so on. But, but it, you but, wouldn't ascribe it to therefore being a, a justification in, in a... Uh, yeah, and it also just seems to be, well, it seems very unfair and excessive. So, for example, I mean, there are some examples we could point to which, you know, the suffering was just dreadful. You're talking about, you know, serial the killers who sort of tortured horribly their victims before they killed them and so forth. Now, you ask yourself the question, you know, why on earth could you could that possibly have been necessary, given the fact that if we're going to have the general idea that we need to have suffering in order to respond with compassion, well, most of us don't have to be confronted with that degree of suffering mm. to learn. So clearly, there's not a general principle, no, no, we really must have the most awful suffering, otherwise no one can learn. Most of us don't. These are, seem to be you know, excessive cases where it's like completely over the top. But it, it, and in that particular case, I guess, Vince might want to bring in another theodicy, that free will, you know. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, there's someone who is carrying out well, such a murderous, torturous act. Well, uh, we're, we're, again... But we're, yes, but the, <laughs> the problem there is that, I mean, that seems odd again, because whatever free will means, um, it, it's clearly a capacity. The capacity to free will is, is got to be something that people vary in their ability to exercise. You know, psychopaths and sociopaths, they do not... You can't, there's no credible account of free will which can say, no, no, those people had exactly the same degree of free will as an ordinary person. They have some, you know, major flaw, and that is a flaw which has emerged in the natural world which, if you're Christian, God has created. So, again, if you want to allow for free will, that doesn't explain why a, a heck of a lot of cases which uh, which go way beyond what is needed mm. in order for people to exercise their free will. And in the case of like, you know, people with uh, psychopaths and so forth, it seems it, those individuals themselves have got some kind of free will deficiency and yeah. problem. They're not, yeah, it's not so much free will as they're, they're mentally ill or, exactly. or whatever is going yeah, on. Yeah. I think it's important, you know, from my perspective that there is, although I completely agree that, you know, suffering often seems excessive, um, uh, and that there are certain approaches which I would particularly not want to say this is a good approach for that type of suffering. I would not want to say that, oh, the world is a, is a classroom that we're learning through mm. and someone had to go through truly horrendous suffering in order to learn. There are certain ways that are appropriate to teach someone and there are certain ways which are not. So I wouldn't want to apply each approach to, to e each type of, of case. It's important to me on my beliefs that there is a limit to um, the extent to which we are uh, 
uh, in a sense, uh, required to be in this state of suffering, that it mm. lasts for a certain amount of time, that there is a certain pain threshold after which our bodies um, turn off, that to not in any way um, to underestimate the degree of suffering that is a reality, but it's important to me also mm. that there are limits that mm. are placed on that. And what, what I find when I look back on my life, and I think this is, is what I would expect to find, is that I look back on some suffering and I say, okay, yes, I can, at the time that seemed utterly pointless and terrible, I can now look back on that and see how there's been some meaning that has been, has been made out of that. It just doesn't necessarily mean that, that God determined it for that reason. It could have been a result of free will, but it could be why God might have allowed it. But then there are other things I look back on in my life, and I still just say, that mm. seems utterly pointless. Mm. That seems terrible mm. and utterly pointless, and I have no idea why God would allow that. But as I get older, Hopefully, as I get more mature, I'm generally able to reflect back and little by little, more of that I can find meaning in. And so if that's the case, and if God's much more knowledgeable than I am, maybe that's what I should expect to find. I can I mean, see the connections with some suffering, but not with all of it. If I could jump in and ask you at this point, Julian, the, the subtitle for the book is Finding Meaning and Comfort When Life mm. Doesn't Make Sense. As an atheist, do you, do you talk about meaning in the context of suffering? because, or, or, or is that sort of out of bounds in the same way that you say the why question kind of has to be dispensed with at some level? Well, Do, do, do you have to just accept, in a sense, that, that evil and suffering don't really have any meaning? Well, you, you, you do in a sense. I mean, yeah, meaning is, is an interesting word. One has to unpack it. But in terms of uh, purpose, then no. No, mm -hmm. that's end of story. Um, standard kind of atheist answer on meaning is, uh, and the one I'd agree with, is that we can find meaning in the world, but in a mm. sense we kind of have to create it. And that's not just a sort of like a, a whimsical individual thing. We find it collectively as well. And we find it in things that, that are seen to be good and other people also believe are good. So it's not just you can decide anything's meaningful and anything isn't. But we have to kind of create it in some way. And, you know, so in that sense, suffering becomes a challenge, you either have to sort of like deal with it in a way that you can get over it mm. and in that sense, you know, turn it into a meaningful experience or not. The point is, and this is the hard, the hard side of atheism, which I think some atheists don't want to acknowledge. Mm. They want to mm. say that, no, 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 everything's left lovely in, in the garden, um, is that sometimes there, there, there really is no meaning to be found. Mm. Although actually, interesting enough, you know, even Vince says he can't see the meaning. And sure. So it's from a practical point of view, we're in the same boat a lot of the time. Um, Vince thinks there's a meaning, he can't see it. We don't think there's a meaning and we can't see it. Sure. Sometimes though, you know, things go wrong and you know, you're talking about looking back of your life, but you know, we're here as the survivors. You know, there are people who can't deal with the suffering, who, who, who take their own lives or who, who go under in some other way. And, you know, the, 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 the difficult pill of the atheist worldview is to accept that, you know, for some lives there is pain and there is suffering and there is no redemption. That is a deep, dark fact about the universe which we have to accept. That is not necessarily easy to do. But the fact that it's difficult to accept it from the atheist point of view is not a reason itself not to accept it. The atheist would say we have to just be honest and accept that there are awful things about the universe and they just are. Let's talk about that just as we start to close things up um, and before, before we have some final thoughts. For you, as much as the problem of suffering does present a serious challenge to Christianity, Vince, what do you make of, as it were, where an atheist goes when it comes to suffering? Would, is it easier for an atheist or, or at some level, it could be said, and I've heard other people say, in, in a sense, I'd rather be confused about what God's up to when it comes to suffering rather than thinking there really just isn't any meaning and we're just floating and it's, it's all random at the end of the day. And that's not what you've said, but, but <laughs> sure. that's what some people sort of sure. do say. Yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, I take great comfort in the hope that I, I think I can find in a loving God existing and in the possibility of, of an afterlife where, where people can have a, a great... Um, eternal life. Um, I pretty recently had uh, an experience with my best friend's father where uh, he was on his deathbed. My best friend asked me to go and, and speak with him. His understanding, he did believe that there was a God of some sort, 
uh, but his understanding of what it meant to be right with God was try to do more good than bad. If you've done enough good at the end of the day, you're going to go to a good place. If you haven't, you know, then you're in trouble. And he reflected back on his life uh, and was coming to the conclusion that, that he was in trouble. <laughs> and, you know, I was so thankful to be able to sit there and think, no, hope is not lost, even on this person who is just, mm. you know, days from their death. And I can say, not only does a God exist, but a God who is not like a Santa Claus or a Father Christmas who's just counting your goods and your bads, mm. a God who loves you more unconditionally for that, um, from my Christian perspective, a God who did himself everything that was necessary in order for you to be right with him, not relying on you to be able to do enough to make yourself right with him. Uh, and so from that perspective, I think that's really significant. You know, that, that I, I never feel like there's a point at which someone is beyond hope mm. uh, and that that's something that, um, that I can share someone even if it is uh, in their final days. I think that's significant. Uh, I mean, another question I'd want to raise, I'd be interested to hear, to hear you talk about this, Julian, uh, from the atheist perspective is, is that, because I think we'd agree, we, we need to be able to say when we, especially when we see horrors, that is evil. That, mm. that is objectively evil. Um, do you think that there's a challenge to saying that from an atheistic perspective? I have my sort of, you know, way of saying of, of, that I believe I can say that because I, think at the center of all reality is a moral being who's loving and good mm. and evil are things that contradict that. Um, is that a challenge for atheism or do you think that there's a, a good way to respond to that? Uh, is it a challenge that, you know, the, the, you're, you're suggesting that there might be a problem for atheists being able to say that is wrong, that is bad? I'm wondering yeah. how... I, just I, identifying I that something is yeah, evil no, I, might, I don't, might be a, a, I, I don't a actually, issue. No, I don't actually see the problem. I think if you set up well, this is quite a complex issue in, in many ways. We'd appreciate <laughs> for the final if, five if, minutes. If you, if you set up, if you set up the idea of objective evil in a particular way, that might become problematic. But you see, I think fundamentally, going back to the, this you know, classic thing, go back to Plato, the Euthypro dilemma. I do think that's pretty clear here. I don't think there's a straightforward way in which accepting a theistic universe. Um, gives you something fundamentally that the atheists don't. And here's why, because the old problem is you believe in a good God at the centre of the universe, this moral being at the core. But you have to ask the question, what makes this God good? Now, if you say, well, you know, God, whatever, God is good because God is God and he, he decides what's good. Mm. Well, that doesn't seem to get, that seems to be the wrong answer. Because I don't think that there are many Christians, <laughs> there might be some, I mean, you know, it's a very diverse world, who would say, yeah, you know what, God could have written those Ten Commandments differently, so they're the exact opposite. If God had said mm. adultery is right, adultery would have been right, full stop. That's not the way most people think about it. Most people say, no, 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 adultery is wrong, and God says it's wrong mm. because it's wrong. Yeah. And that opens up this gap, you see, between there's something about the concept, the idea of goodness, which seems to stand by itself. What enables you to say God is good is because the two things don't mean exactly the same thing. Um, even though, as a matter of, in other ways, you might say God might be the source of all goodness, mm -hmm. the cause of all goodness, mm -hmm. what it means to be good has got to be understood in a way which is independent of God. Now, you can understand that in many ways. You could understand it in a way which makes it completely objective in some way. You could understand it in, a, in, in, in other ways which don't require it to stand mm. outside of time in some way. Whichever way you do it, I think you know, the same kind of thing is open to you as an atheist or, mm. or as a religious I think believer. I think you're right. Uh, at some point, anyone hits explanatory bedrock. Yeah. Right? We can keep saying why, 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 and at some point, each of us is going to stop. I'm mm. going to stop with God's nature and say that's just how God's nature is. You're going to stop at something as well. Um, I think what's important from my perspective is, is that I, to stop with something stable, mm. that there's a sort of stability to morality if I ground it in God's nature mm. and if God's a necessary being. And sometimes what I find challenging is, is thinking of what the naturalistic alternatives are that have the sort of stability about morality that I think we want to say is true when we claim that is objectively evil and would be in mm. any situation. We've opened up a big can of worms yes. Yes. <laughs> with, with very short <laughs> period to go on, on the show and, and something that we've addressed uh, in other yes. shows as well and, and so on. And 
I think uh, you three froze dilemma is essentially what you've, you've, yes, right, you've elucidated yep. there, Julian. But it, it, it is an interesting one. And one I think you, you tackle a little bit at the start of the book, Vince, along with Ravi, um, mm. the, this question of what is suffering? You know, is there an objective realm of, mm. of evil and so on? But um, it's been really interesting. Great to have you both on the program today. A serious subject, but I really appreciated the way in which you've both uh, thought about it and talked it through in, in a very gracious way. Um, uh, do you, do you think you'll ever write on this particular subject? Maybe you have. Right? I don't well, know I've done um, I've done short things in introductory um, introductory books, so um, I, I'm not sure that it's something I'd, I'd really turn to. But if, if I've got time, I, mean, I, just, I mean, I must say I, I struggle with the issue because for me, there's there's something about theodicy which I find kind of troubling. In all mm. the people I interviewed for the Flossers magazine, the, the only time I interviewed someone and I had a kind of almost a visceral kind of reaction against them, was a, a, a well-known theologian who was explaining away evil. And it seems to me that, I think, I mean, Vincent said this at various points, I, th I actually think the only honest way to deal with suffering as a Christian is to say that at some, in some way, it's got to be for the greater good. Right. But it is utterly mysterious how it is. I think the moment you try and make sense of it, you risk sort of sounding um, crass, crass, and, and yeah, almost obscene sure, at times, you know. Yeah. And I, 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 so in that sense, I don't think it is a decisive objection mm. I, against religion. But I think the best response is not to try and explain it, but to, to, to truly embrace the idea that if there is a God, then this God is is in lots of ways way beyond our comprehension, and we should accept that mystery. The problem is that, I as a matter of fact, people only tend to embrace the mystery when they reach. <laughs> Uh, the, the difficulties sure. in their own position. I, I, I think that there should be, I think the most honest way to approach belief is to accept a lot more mystery actually. <laughs> mm. yeah. one, of the, one of the ways in which I try to move away from a greater goods approach uh, a bit, I think in part for some of the reasons that, that you've given is, is by, by trying to focus on people, saying that ultimately if I believe in a loving God, his, his central concern has to be about people, about individuals, and about love for them, not about these questions of can I get more generic or global sure. or maximal value this and, way And inevitably, as we said at the beginning, <clears throat> a theodicy is not what someone in suffering usually needs at That's the right. moment they're mm. suffering. But, but uh, it's been really interesting to have you both on the program. Thank you very much, Julian and Vince, for being with me. If you want to find out more about both my guests, uh, theocker.org for Vince Vitali. Julian Bagini is at microphilosophy.net. I'll make sure to post uh, some links to books and further resources if you want to find out more. In the meantime, thank you very much for joining me on the show today, Julian and Vince. Thank you both. Thanks a lot. Tune in to Unbelievable with Justin Briley every Saturday at 2.30 only on Premier Christian Radio where faith comes to life. <laughs>